Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on the AES Unmanned Extreme Heat Inspections Challenge. My name is Casey Shapiro, and I will be your host and moderator for this webinar. Uh, just a note that this webinar is being recorded and is going to be transcribed for viewing on the challenge website at a later date. So at this time, I'm just going to briefly go through the agenda for the webinar. First, we're going to provide the speaker introductions, and then we'll provide an overview of the challenge. After that, we'll go through the frequently asked um, questions of the challenge and then work through a live audience Q&A. To participate in that live Q&A, please submit your questions at any time through the Q&A chat box. We'll go ahead and collect and present those questions during that live Q&A section. If we don't answer your question live due to time, uh, please note that we are, again, transcribing and then answering, we'll, we, we will answer those questions um, asked during the session and then post them on that challenge forum for viewing after the um, webinar concludes. Finally, we'll wrap up with the information that, on what you can do today including where to register, how to stay connected, and how to submit your um, proposal. Now I am pleased to welcome the following speakers to our webinar this morning. From AES, we have Sarah Salati, Managing Director, New Energy Solutions, and Bradley Scott, Director of Regulated Generation, Indianapolis Power and Light, U.S. Strategic Business Unit. And then from Nine Sigma, we have Pam Semenik, Program Manager. So the AES Unmanned Extreme Heat Inspection Challenge aims to improve safety and help solve a $1 billion problem for the global electric utility industry. I'm going to hand it over to Sarah right now to provide an overview on AES and the need for this challenge. So Sarah, you are good to go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for all of you who are joining. Uh, I'm Sarah Salati. Uh, at AES, our mission is to deliver valuable infrastructure to society, and we aim to do that by delivering electricity reliably because we believe it improves the lives in all of the markets in which we operate. We care about making this infrastructure and service better, and this is the first context uh, for the challenge that we're going to discuss today. Next slide. In addition to delivering the infrastructure and service reliably, we also aim to embody our company's first value, which is to put safety first. Electricity has inherent safety hazards, and anything that we can do to reduce the exposure of our people and our communities to those inherent hazards is extremely important to us. And so this is the second context for our challenge. Next slide. AES is focused on innovation since its founding, and we're excited to extend this work outside of the walls of our company in partnership with Nine Sigma. We're excited to see the solutions that you have to provide us as part of the challenge, and we're also excited to leverage our global platform, which is in 17 countries, to deliver as many of these innovative energy solutions to as many people as possible in the markets in which we operate. So with that, I'll just pass it back to Pam to discuss the specifics about the unmanned extreme heat inspection challenge. Hi, everybody. This is Pam Semenik. For those of you who may not have seen the challenge that's posted on the website, I wanted to give you just a, a, an overview of what we're seeking. An unexpected power outage has the ability to shut down an entire city. That entire city can lose power. Unplanned outages have the capacity to unplug millions of people in a single occurrence. Industrial energy generators operate under conditions of very, very high heat. During these unplanned outages, it takes about 36 hours for the plant to cool down enough to reach a level that somebody wearing personal protective equipment can safely enter and inspect and repair that equipment after the outage. It's not only potentially hazardous work for that person that has to go in, but it increases the time it takes to bring the lights back on. It's estimated that hundreds of power plants are offline all across the world, in part due to outage-related in inspections, and that represents about a $1 billion loss in, in power capacity. The objective of this challenge is to shorten the duration of the power plant downtime. 
the ability to perform the inspection without having to wait for the heat to drop significantly is of critical importance, and that's why AES is running this challenge. Next slide, please. You can find all the details of the challenge at the Nine Sites platform, and I recommend that you refer to that to the content on the site for reference. What I wanted to tell, talk about, though, is what the successful solution is, will look like, what AES is looking for. Um, so AES is trying to find a way to enable unmanned inspections of the industrial boilers under these extreme heat conditions, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, a, a successful solution that can enable the detection of wall thinning or boiler tubes is also of significant importance. Um, and providing the equivalent of, of doing that inspection using unmanned, excuse me, using unmanned technologies that, that reproduce what is done in a manned inspection is also very, very important. And you'll see the criteria listed below. Solutions that are proposed to this challenge must have supporting data. Solutions that enable a device, such as high temperature materials or optics or even remote sensing capabilities, um, are all desired for this contest as long as they can lead directly to the realization of the desired outcome. Proposed solutions must demonstrate that clear path to the realization, and we would ask you to um, outline, outline what that pathway is when you submit your proposal. I will now turn the presentation over to Brad for discussion of some of the details of the boiler environment. Okay, hey Brad, you're good to go. <laughs> All right, thanks, Pam. Um, so let me start out just by giving uh, everyone a, a feel for exactly the size uh, of these boilers. You know, this is not a you know high school boiler down in a you know small room. This is a extremely large you know 10 plus stories uh, utility scale boiler. Um, and as you look at the picture uh, that's shown here on this slide. If you look right down in the lower left, you'll see an orange arrow just to the right of the number 10, and you'll see a, a, a person standing there. It may be hard to see that that's actually a person, but that basically gives you the scale of the of the size, you know, the size and of these utility boilers. So very, very large um, uh, spaces uh, that these things take up. Um, and maybe if we could just go back one slide. Just wanted to point out one thing. So, what you see here in this picture is a person working on um, what we call the tubes. And you know, tubes is a little bit misleading. These are really pieces of pipe. Um, they're about two and a quarter inches in diameter, and the thickness of the wall is usually greater than a quarter of an inch. Um, you see in the second bullet point there under uh, item three. Um, that 0 0.260 inches of MWT, that means min wall thickness. So typically, um, these, these thicknesses are greater than that. We, we will go in and replace the tubes if they get lower than that um, 0.260. But these, these tubes um, are all you know, sitting next to each other. We call this a tangent tube design. And then run, they run the entire length of the boiler uh, in, in the furnace area. Um, which is represented by that little um, circular picture, that would be standing in the bottom of the furnace looking up. And you can see it's just a wide open cavity. Um, and those walls that you see are made up of the tubes you see uh, over to the left that one of the workers is, is repairing. So just to give everybody a feel for just the size of, of these utility boilers. So if we go back to the, earlier, the next slide. So just another uh, by way of background, what happens is um, we pump water at extremely high pressures, um, typically anywhere from 2,500 pounds per square inch up to over 3,600 pounds per square inch. Um, we pump water into these tubes and then as we fire the boiler and typically when we say fire the boiler that's either by um, pulverizing coal and burning the coal within the furnace proper or it can also be natural gas at some of our other units. Um, those are our primary two fuels uh, in these large industrial boil uh, utility sized boilers. Um, and that furnace uh, proper there, which you see on the left, which labeled as furnace, you know, that will run somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,700 to 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Um, a good analogy, it would be nice if we had a video, but it's, it's difficult to get videos of these things. But if you've ever seen the videos of a, of a steel making blast furnace and when they open the door and let the steel, you know, the molten steel run out, that bright, bright fire that you see contained in that blast furnace, that's the equivalent of what we have here. So as we burn the coal or the natural gas, um, we generate steam and that steam is heated up to about a thousand degrees. So while the, the furnace uh, gas temperatures are up over 2600, um, the water and steam mixture that's in the tubes uh, doesn't go above a thousand degrees. Um, and as you move back through the, the furnace into, if you see in the upper right where it says convection pass, um, that, that uh, gas begins to cool slightly and when it leaves the boiler uh, down in the lower right, uh, it's down to about 700 to 800 degrees uh, as it transfers its heat uh, to the steam. So what happens in the purpose of the challenge is that as we burn either coal or gas, and it's usually more of a coal problem, um, these walls erode. Uh, coal is fairly abrasive um, and then as it, it burns it turns into ash which is also abrasive. Um, but it also can be, uh, with natural gas as well, we can also have a corrosion issue in certain areas, uh, depending on, you know, how we manage our water chemistry and a number of other factors. So as these walls thin, um, they can get to the point where they spring a leak, basically. Um, and that leak could either be water or steam, depending on where you are within the circuitry. Uh, and that requires us to shut the unit down to go in and repair uh, that leak. Um, and if the leak is over on the right side where you see the little, all the green arrows, those are entry points. Um, typically those are, those are not too difficult to get to. Um, the challenge there is the heat because these surfaces are all running, you know, up over a thousand degrees. Uh, and this is, you know, a 10 to 12 story building. Uh, the time it takes to cool off can be extremely long. And depending on the design of the boiler, this is a, what we call a typical utility boiler. There's also another uh, design boiler we have in our fleet called a circulating fluidized bed boiler, uh, which takes even longer, and we'll discuss that in just a minute. But anyways, if we have a leak in the furnace proper, um, it can be anywhere along uh, that 150 foot uh, height of the boiler, and to get up to identify where the leak is uh, can be extremely challenging. Um, it either requires us to build scaffolding up to that point or we can also hang what I'll call the equivalent of a window washer um, but a single basket, we call it a sky climber, and lower that down to the bottom of the furnace and then a worker climbs in it and raises himself up uh, to find where the leak is. Both of these, both, both of these um, identification techniques take a lot of time. Uh, number one, we have to wait for the boiler uh, to cool off to below 100 degrees. Um, and that's a average temperature um, because what we find is even at 100 degrees F on the furnace exit gas temperature, the, the tube surfaces themselves can still be up over 140, 150 degrees. Um, and just for reference, you know, typically most people aren't able to hold their hand on something hotter than about 130 degrees. So it becomes a challenge for us to uh, safely uh, put people in, in, the, uh, in these enclosures. Um, without the right uh, protective equipment um, or exposing them to, you know, heat stress, other things uh, that, that, that would uh, be created by that hot environment. So what we, were, what we would like to see is a solution to allow us to, number one, not have to send our people in there and expose them to these hazardous environments, but also do it sooner. Um, the quicker we can identify where the leak is, the sooner then we can develop a repair plan um, and understand exactly what is going to be required. Sometimes these tubes can be a, just a single tube with a small pinhole leak and that one can be repaired fairly quickly. But as we get up into those, um, it's the pinkish section, um, those, that's what we call our superheat section and those tubes are just hanging uh, from the, from the uh, roof of the boiler. And if one of those ruptures, uh, it typically starts to swing around almost like a you know, like a fire hose and can do a lot of damage uh, up in that section um, and turn, you know, those, those pendant tubes uh, into what looks like spaghetti sometimes. And that requires a lot more work. And so understanding just what we're up against 
uh, as soon as we can allows us to then put a, a much more comprehensive repair plan back together as well as minimize the impact to our customers. Um, if we know the unit's only going to be down for two or three days, uh, we can make arrangements to, to uh, deal with that. Uh, but if it's going to be down for two or three weeks or you know, uh, longer, um, then that would require a much more uh, comprehensive um, mitigation plan uh, for our customers. So if we go to the next slide, there we go. So this is an illustration um, of what I was talking about uh, as far as cooling down. Um, the yellow line there, that's our gross megawatt, so that's the output of the power plant itself. Um, the, the steam we make in the, in the boiler goes to a steam turbine, turbine spins, and we make electricity. Uh, and this is an example of a 500 megawatt unit. So you can see there at around you know, 0800, uh, the unit was run along at 500 megawatts. Um, the furnace exagas temperature, that's all the way in the back, was about 560 degrees. And right around 9 a.m., there was some kind of a failure, uh, most likely a tube leak, and the unit came off immediately. And you can see the, the length of time it took to cool that unit down uh, to the 100 degree temperature where we can allow um, our folks to go in and, and be, begin to identify where the leak occurred. Um, you know, it comes down quite quickly to begin with, but then, you know, depending on the ambient air temperatures and some other factors, um, you know, that last 100 degrees is, is tough to get to. Um, so if we could get in there at that 300 degree mark, or even better, the 500 degree mark, um, you could see we would be able almost, you know, within the first two to three hours, be able to go in and identify where the tube leak was. So that's the, that's the goal here. If we go to the next slide, it's a, it's a picture of, uh, this is a different unit, which takes even longer uh, to cool down. Um, this is a CFB that uh, um, basically it has a uh, fluidized bed of coal and limestone, which is very good from an em emission standpoint, but requires a whole lot longer to cool down because of the, the amount of bed material that's contained in there. And that's another point that I think is important to make is these are not pristine environments. Uh, this would not be like flying a drone, you know, out on a smokestack or things, you know, um, you know, in the uh, in the wide open space, uh, we burn you know probably in the neighborhood of about 250,000 pounds of coal every hour uh, in these large utility scale boilers, and that's a lot of material. And when the units trip, a lot of it goes out into our ash handling systems, but a lot of it stays uh, in the boiler itself. So it can be very dusty. Um, that fly ash can build up in different areas depending on how the airflow. And so um, whatever the uh, solution uh, is would have to be robust enough to deal with that fly ash, um, you know, flying around uh, in the same space as, the, as the, uh, the, the drone or whatever the solution turns out to be. Um, on our natural gas boilers, it's not as much of an issue uh, because it is, um, you know, not a solid uh, fuel. Um, but there still is, you know, other dust and debris that, that would be present, uh, even in the gas-fired boilers. Um, you know, a few other points. We did receive some, some questions, um, you know, about exactly what does an inspection entail. And it's, it's really pretty much a visual uh, look to see, like I said, where the leak is and, you know, how, how um, extensive the damage uh, is from the leak. Um, you know, steam at 1,000 degrees and, and 3,600 pounds um, is extremely uh, difficult uh, to contain. So it typically cuts through adjacent tubes um, and, like I said, begins to, to whip around like a fire hose um, under those pressures. Um, we typically, you know, in, 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 our, in today's world, all these inspections are done within the boiler proper. Um, however, if you know, a solution provider was able to develop something that allowed us allowed us to do these inspections externally. Uh, that 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 would be terrific. Like I said, anything to keep our people um, out of this environment is really what we're after here. Um, is the is you know safe inspections as well as timely inspections. As far as other techniques we use um, to inspect. Um, we try and stay ahead of these leaks. We try and find them before they actually uh, are a through wall crack. Um, so we do have a number of different uh, non-destructive examination methods. 
Um, things like phased array, ultrasonic testing. We use dipenetrate testing, a thing called mag particle um, that can identify where cracks are occur occurring. We do some x-ray uh, as well uh, when we do tube um, welds to ensure we don't have any porosity or lack of fusion within the weld. Uh, so there's another, a number of different uh, proactive techniques we use to identify these tubes before they occur. Um, however, this is really to one, once that leak has occurred to identify where it is and, and how bad it is. Um, as far as what it may look like, you know, um, typically when we when we go in to try and find these leaks, um, if they're in the excuse me in the water walls, it's usually water spraying out. Um, this would be water at probably anywhere from 150 to 200 degrees because there's still a lot of heat. Uh, remaining in the in the boiler, so hot water. Um, if it's up in the upper sections of the furnace, there still could be steam present, um, although it would probably be a saturated steam mixture, so um, uh, not to get too deep into thermodynamics, but you know, superheated steam is, is basically invisible. Um, it's not until it begins to condense that you can actually see the steam, so um, that's what we would typically see up in the superheat uh, sections is uh, a steam leak, but um, a saturated mixture uh, that, would, that you could see uh, visually. I think that's most of the technical um, points that I wanted to, to make. Um, you know, it, it, there was one other question about how long it takes us to do these inspections. You know, once we get into the, into the boiler, um, they really don't take that long, a couple hours, three, maybe four hours. Uh, it's really the cool down and the staging of the equipment to gain access to the location that takes all the time for us. Um, once we're in there, usually we can find them fairly quickly um, you know, using just flashlights uh, and, and a couple of people uh, climbing around. Um, so I think with that, I will, I will hand it back um, to Pam. Great. Thanks, Brad. That was, a, that was an excellent description of the background, and hopefully the solution provider community is thinking around how to respond um, with their technology. So I wanted to just briefly touch upon how that's done and what, what we require for this submission. I would refer you to the challenge website. Um, so on the NYSIDES platform, you can see the challenge details and also the ability to submit your proposal through our online form. Your response must include the information listed here on this slide. How does your technology contribute to a comprehensive, complete solution for AES? Please provide detailed descriptions of your technology, including the mechanism for how it moves around in a boiler environment, its inspection capabilities, and its tolerance to high temperatures. Um, we would also want to know if you have a prototype or a demonstration available. Please submit any supporting data and any other details that would permit ACS, I'm sorry, AES to thoroughly review your approach. Through the Nine Sites platform, you're able to upload documents, images, other supporting information relative to your submission, and we would encourage you to do that. Please give us as much information as, as you have so that we can evaluate accordingly. This just shows our timeline. So we did launch this challenge on November 7th. Today is the 29th already. Submission deadline will be the end of February, February 28th, 2017 with the winning innovation being announced in July of next year. AES will choose three of the top technology submissions for a $10,000 cash award each. Those three winners will be eligible to compete for a contract with AES up for up to $1 million. You may only submit information that is of a non-confidential nature. You must confirm through the submission portal that your response does not contain any confidential information. Response submitters retain their IP, and winners of the $10,000 cash prize, the $10,000 cash prizes must agree to execute a confidentiality confidenti agreement with AES. <laughs> so now we're going into the challenge FAQs. These are um, questions that we have fielded from the inquiries to Nine Sigma's provider help desk and from the challenge sites forum. Um, we are going to be volleying these between um, Pam and Brad, so I'll go ahead and um, have Pam ask the first question. Must the inspection be done from the inside or outside of the walls, or does it matter? So Brad, you should be good to go. Okay, yep. So yeah, I think I addressed that. We are really indifferent, um, you know, as far as where the inspection has to take place. 
um, you know, and that's where we're really looking out for the, you know, the innovation here. If there's ways that the inspections could take place from outside the boiler, that would be terrific. Because, like I said, you know, our ability to keep our people safe is number one in our in our book. It's our it's our number one value at AES. And so, yeah, um, we are indifferent as long as we're able to get a good understanding of the size and the scope of the repair. The second question, and I know, Brad, that you did give a very detailed description of the boiler environment, but one of the questions was, are the two walls open at the top? No, this is all a contained closed loop cycle. Um, basically, you know, we pump the water into what we call uh, water wall headers. Um, the header is just a, a big uh, pipe that all of the smaller tubes are then welded into, um, and that uh, then flows up through the boiler to another set of headers, which then transport it to the other um, areas within the within the convection pass. If you remember that diagram, uh, but it's all enclosed, uh, and then it heads to the turbine. Uh, once it goes through the turbine, uh, we then condense the remaining steam back into water uh, in what's called a condenser. And then we pump it back into the boiler, and the whole thing starts over again. Um, there is some blowdown uh, that occurs, and we do use some steam for auxiliary uh, systems, uh, and we have to make up that water. Um, but that's um, relatively a small amount compared to the overall steam cycle. So, so closed loop. Um, we hope you know to get at least you know five or six cycles of the of the water before uh, it has to be replaced. The other question, next question is, although you're focused on activities that follow a forced outage, would technology solutions that prevented the incident in the first place also be considered for this challenge? Yeah, most definitely. Um, and that, I tried to touch on that, you know, with some of the other um, NDE techniques that we use. Um, during our outages, you know, we, we do try and get in there. And, and as far as tube leaks, um, you know, probably the ultrasonic testing is, is our is our first uh, first line of defense, I'll call it, um, where we will go in and map the entire tube wall um, during during outages, whether it's a forced outage, we'll get as much as we can, and then during planned outages, which can be anywhere from three to eight weeks, um, we'll go in and do a, a lot more uh, examination of the water walls. Um, and this also includes the header areas. Um, we'll even get into what's called a replication, where we can actually do an examination of the grain structure of the metal uh, to see if we're starting to get micro cracks uh, beginning in those in those header materials. So yeah, um, anything that can get us you know out in front of this so that we aren't actually being reactive, which is what we typically would call uh, a tube leak, uh, and being proactive so we can uh, replace or um, beef up you know the tube wall material. We're only able to you know lay additional weld material on top of the tubes. If we do see an area that's thinning, we call that pad welding. Um, so yeah, anything to get us, uh, like I said, out ahead of the curve um, would would be uh, would be terrific. Hi, Brad. Thank you so much. You know what? Um, I was in a quick conversation with Sarah. I wanted to go ahead and give her an opportunity to do some more, uh, further clarification on that question. Go ahead, Sarah. Hi. Yes. Thanks very much, um, Brad, for any, sharing that that perspective. We do and are constantly looking for new ideas and novel solutions to be preventative uh, with regard to these types of tube wall leaks. But in order for us to be focused in this challenge, and uh, we are looking at opportunities and solutions that would be specific to dealing with the forced outage itself and bringing us back online um, more quickly. So for the for the solution community, focusing on the um, on the activities post outage for shortening the amount of time and keeping people out of the boiler is is really the, where the the main focus is for this challenge. Thanks. Great, thank you, Sarah, for that clarification. Um, so now we are going to go ahead and move into the live Q&A section. Um, we are going to open it up to the questions that we've been receiving during the entire webinar. I want to go ahead and encourage everybody to continue um, 
sending those questions through to us so that we can continue this um, live Q&A session. It, you, it allows you to really um, ask whatever specific questions you have and get an immediate answer. So it's a great opportunity for all the solution providers on the line. Um, again, we're going to take the rest of this time to go live. If we um, do, don't get to your question, just a reminder from earlier that it is being recorded and archived and will be transcribed. And any answer that doesn't get answered live will be answered in that transcription that will be posted on the challenge website at a later date. So I'm going to um, show you that we are going to be um, joined from a few, a few, by a few different members from the AES team. We have Adam um, Brown, Zach Penix, and Chris Shelton, who will be joining us, um, joining Sarah, Bradley, Pam, and myself to help answer these questions for us. I'm going to keep this slide up so that you can put a face with the voice. Um, so um, let's go ahead and get started. And um, the first question we have is, um, and I'm sure most of these are probably going to go to Brad, considering the, the, <laughs> the, the technical nature of them. But um, the very first one is, how much space is there around the main surface of the furnace? And if our build consists of working around the boiler, how much space can we use up? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I apologize for not covering that um, during while we were talking about the boiler. Um, you know, as far as space around the boiler, I would say it's fairly fairly wide open um, there are some areas where it's where it's uh, a bit tight you know, especially around where the burner the burner pipes are when whether they're bringing up the coal or the uh, natural gas um, but there's there's um, there's ample space I'd say around the boiler uh, typically there are uh, platforms um, about the same um, uh, regularity is a is a is a commercial building, so you know every 10 to 15 feet as you move up the unit, there's a platform, um, and they can extend out you know 20, 30, 40 feet uh, from the boiler. Um, probably the 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 restriction is going to be getting into the boiler. Um, typically, we go through what's called a manway, uh, and a manway is is um, think of like a porthole on a ship. It's about three feet uh, tall and maybe two and a half feet uh, wide, uh, oval in, 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 in nature, um, which you know uh, most people uh, can fit through fairly easily. Um, but uh, you know if if the solution was you know something you know bigger than that opening, uh, it would be difficult to gain access. On some of the large units, there are bigger doors um, uh, in the lower furnace. Um, uh, but that isn't a consistent um, access point uh, on all of our units. So uh, that's probably the one restriction that, that I think folks should be aware of is uh, getting into the boiler proper. Once you're in the boiler, you know, these things are, like I said, pretty wide open, you know, 50 to 60 feet wide and, you know, maybe 40 feet deep and then, you know, 150 feet high. So that's pretty wide open. But uh, getting, getting into there could be, could be somewhat of a restriction. I don't know, Adam Brown, you want to add anything on that? Uh, no, I think you pretty well covered it. Uh, the doors are, are various sizes, and, and that is a, uh, it's, it's a potential restriction. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you both, Adam and um, Brad. So we're going to go ahead and move down to the second question that we have. Um, we have, um, so it's kind of a multi-part question, but it all um, pertains to itself. So are the tubes in rows? How many are the, how many tubes are there? Um, what is the access like to the tubes and how is the spacing between the tubes? So the tubes themselves, um, I don't know off the top of my head, maybe Adam does, but they're, they're what we call, like I said, tangent tubes. So there's the tube, there's a small little, um, what we call membrane uh, between the tube, and then there's another tube, and I'd say less than five inches from center line to center line, uh, tube to tube. So they are very closely spaced, um, you know, together. Um, I think I answered the access to the tube uh, themselves. Um, you know, internally, there's virtually no access to the internals of the tube. This would all be external. Was there more to that question? I didn't write it down. 
So it was um, how many how many tubes were there? Are they in rows? What is the access to them? And what is the spacing like between? That's just yeah, so, so, so they are all on the walls. We call them basically the term is water walls. You know, these are just in a one panel, you know, one single row of tubes uh, that create the walls. Um, and as far as how many tubes, uh, I'd have to do the math of, you know, a 60-foot water wall with, you know, tubes on five-inch centers, whatever that number turned out to be. But it's certainly something we could follow up on if it's, if it's an important uh, aspect for the, for the uh, solution. Okay, so um, the next um, question is a two-part, and it, it's um, pertaining to a specific solution. So um, really, what happens if they were to be using a, a, an inspection drone and it fails within the boiler and falls down? Will it hurt the boiler? Is there any um, issues behind that, that type of um, question regarding that specific type of uh, solution? Uh, I'd be very surprised if you were able to do any damage to the boiler. Um, you know, typically these things are designed for large uh, pieces of slag to fall. Um, and so, you know, unless you had something that was really heavy, you know, which I don't think would work too well to try and fly or, or climb, um, you know, I, I would be very surprised if, if you would do any damage to the boiler. These are all you know, either stainless steel or some kind of a carbon steel blend um, materials, uh, pretty robust. So no, I'd be I'd be very surprised if you could if you could do any damage to them. Great. So the next question is, how much standardization is there in pipe dimensions and configuration from plant to plant? It's fairly standard. What will vary is either the min wall thickness uh, or the spacing of the tubes. Um, in some of our lower pressure boilers, um, we actually will set the tubes right up against each other. There is no membrane between them. Um, and they, those will typically be a, a larger diameter um, that we're able to use for the lower pressure uh, boilers. Um, some of our um, uh, boilers, um, because of uh, the erosive nature, uh, of the uh, of the coal uh, could have a coating on them, a refractory coating, um, but typically those aren't areas where we see tube leaks. So I wouldn't I wouldn't um, worry about having to getting you know for the solution to be able to get through that that refractory coating. Um, but as far as the tube materials, they're all like I said fairly standard materials uh, of construction. Be it a, like I said a stainless steel or some kind of a a carbon steel alloy. Um, and as far as spacing, like I said, probably the smallest are the two and a quarter tubes we see in the uh, the very high pressure applications, but no more. I'm not aware of anything greater than a five inch diameter tube. It's like I said in some of the the lower pressure um, uh, boilers that we have. So fairly standard. Um, you know the the square box configuration of the furnace is fairly standard. Um, you know what we call the convection pass, where the pendants hang in the back pass. There, that's all fairly standard design um, across the fleet, at least in the U.S. Great. Thank you, Brad. So the next question is, <clears throat> do any off-the-shelf technologies look promising except for the fact that they need to operate in those high heat temperatures? So we have used um, basically, you know, uh, drones that are available to us today. Um, and we've had some limited success. Um, but typically, um, with the existing drone requirements, um, we're not able to utilize them much sooner than we can utilize a person. Um, so it saves us a little bit of time, but not anything of significance. And that's really what we're driving here, is to be able to get in there um, and do these inspections much, much sooner um, than we're able to now, and with a little bit more um, uh, robustness, I'll call it. Um, you know, a person... Uh, we do our best to get him as close to the leak as we can, but he still, you know, can be, you know, 20, 30 feet away from the leak. And then, you know, we'll try and use binoculars and flashlights. Um, but if you had some, you know, like I said, a high temperature drone is kind of what we're thinking here um, to get it right up close uh, and really get a good picture uh, of exactly what's going on um, as well as, you know, move back and forth 
if there's other areas in the furnace that we're concerned about um, while we're in there, uh, I think would be extremely helpful. So. Great, thank you. So the next question, um, regarding the corrosion that was um, spoken about earlier, does the corrosion to the tubes come from outside of the tubes, uh, meaning the heat and cold particles, or inside of the tubes specifically um, uh, regarding the water that is um, constantly flowing through the tubes? Really good question, and, and honestly, it can come from either side. Um, we typically work very, very hard to keep our water chemistry uh, very tightly controlled, um, but we do have excursions, uh, and when those excursions occur, uh, it can attack the internal of the tube, and we call that under-deposit corrosion. There is a layer called magnetite that forms on the internal of these tubes, um, which builds up over time uh, just because we're not able to get all of the uh, solid, solid particles within the within the water out of the water so it plates out on the internal of the tubes and if we have any kind of a uh, chemistry upset uh, it can impact that and, uh, and form basically a salt underneath that magnetite layer which then leads to um, internal corrosion. Um, externally uh, typically we see corrosion mainly in the lower furnace um, because of some of the requirements we have for emissions controls we have to limit the amount of air that we send to the combustion process. Um, we call that staging combustion and it can create what's called a reducing atmosphere down in the lower furnace and uh, that will corrode the tubes uh, on the external. Um, also if, um, if we have a leak and we have a lot of fly ash in the, in the, in the boiler and it sits on the tubes because the fly ash does con uh, contain uh, sulfur and nitrous oxide um, you know, materials, um, that can set up a, a you know an acidic reaction as well uh, against the two materials. So really, it can be on either side. Um, I'd say typically we see more of the external corrosion in the furnace proper, uh, and then the internal corrosions usually not as prevalent. Like I said, if we're if we're keeping good tabs on our water chemistry. Hi. Um, so this is a follow-up, Brad, to the uh, to the question um, regarding. You obviously mentioned some chemicals being used in the water. Um, which chemicals are being used, and and will that affect anything? Um. Yeah, I'm getting to the limit of my knowledge here. <laughs> we use some phosphates, some different things. Um, I'd have to research exactly what chemicals we we use right now. I don't know, Adam, do you know off the top of your head what we're using right now for chemical control? Uh, so so it it kind of varies. We use oxygenated treatment. We use hydrazine. Uh, we use deionizing systems. Uh, we use Powdex resins. Uh, it kind of varies based on the vintage of the plant. Yeah, and I'd say I wouldn't expect it to be um, detrimental to the to the uh, to the drone or whatever the solution turns out to be, um, it would you know it would have to stand up to some you know some water on it, but it's not going to be anything you know either very low or very high pH. You know, typically you know these units run between maybe five and a half at the low end of the pH and and maybe eight at the upper end. Um, but typically we like to keep them right in that you know six to seven uh, pH range. So nothing that I would call um, you know, uh, highly uh, you know, corrosive to 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 the um, to the device. Great. So, um, next question is: um, What is the maximum linear path distance between an entry point and a tube to be inspected? The maximum, probably that 150 feet. Um, you know, if you went in at the very lowest you know, level of the boiler and you had to get all the way up to the roof. The, the, the roof of the boiler as well is made up of tube material. So that would probably be the maximum, I would say. Great. Um, next question. In how many facilities would AES use this technology if it's effective? So I'll just try and do this off the top of my head. In California, we have uh, six, ten, 12 boilers um, of, of relative sizes. Uh, in Ohio, we have five boilers 
in these ranges. In Indiana, we have uh, five, seven boilers in this area. Um, we have four down in Oklahoma. We have two in Hawaii. We have um, two more in um, in Maryland. So they add all those up. I'm not sure what you get to, but so I'd say I don't know, probably 20. Top of my head. Great, thank you so much. Um, so next question, is AES looking for exclusive ownership and or use of the technology or is it something that they're open to seeing deployed across the industry? Uh, this is Sarah, can I comment? Sure can. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I didn't know if that was No, I mean, no, we're, we, uh, we're, as I articulated in the beginning of the, of the presentation that we're in in 17 countries, multiple markets. We've introduced uh, some of these novel boiler technologies into other markets that didn't have them as part of our innovative work around the time of our founding. And so we have a global platform and multiple units that we could use this technology in. So we, of course, are open to to helping as many as many markets as possible. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so um, we wanted to have a quick point of clarity around an earlier question that was asked um, regarding the off-the-shelf um, technologies. So I'm going to go ahead and um, throw it to Pam really quickly so she can provide some clarity around um, the types of solutions that AES is looking for at this point. Right. And I just would like the solution provider community to be aware that AES does not necessarily have a predisposed notion of what this looks like. We're, we're really looking to try to find novel, unique methods to achieve the desired outcome. Um, AES is open to evaluating, evaluating any of the potential solutions that come through that could meet that criteria. So I know that we discussed, you know, what are some things that maybe are, are nearer term or what has been used in the past. I would really like the OI, the open innovation community, to, to be aware that we are open to to what you have to offer, and we are really interested in seeing what can be what we can find through that open innovation community. Great. And on that note, we are um, nearing the end of our time together. Thank you, everybody, for submitting all of these questions. Like I said, if anything has not been answered live and we've been keeping track, we will have a transcribed answer for you available in the challenge forum after, I mean, yes, in the challenge forum after the um, webinar concludes a few days after. Give us a, couple, uh, give us a little bit of time to get it all um, put together for you. Um, and so as we wrap up now, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an idea of what you can do today. Um, we've mentioned a number of times to so please visit the challenge um, website, which is www.aes.com slash beat the heat. Um, if you need help, you can provide or <clears throat> send questions to our Nine Sigma Solution Provider Help Desk. Um, you can email us at phd at ninesigma.com or you can call us at plus one two one six two eight three three nine zero one. And then of course you want to submit your proposal. The deadline again for submissions is February twenty eighth, twenty seventeen at five PM Eastern Standard Time. Again, this concludes our webinar for today. Um, please continue to um, visit the um, challenge website to get any more information and to obviously uh, get these assets to you at, after the fact. Um, we are going to remind you one last time that this was recorded and it's going to be made available. Um, we want to thank everybody for attending and thank you also to their speakers for their time and expertise. Um, we appreciate everybody's time and we look forward to receiving your submissions. Thank you everybody and have a great day.